Today we're going to be looking at the basics of the federal bureaucracy. Let's look at the objectives. What is the purpose of the federal bureaucracy? How is the bureaucracy structured? And lastly, what are the functions and responsibilities of the Executive Office of the President, the Cabinet, and independent agencies? Our quote for today comes from Joseph Schumpter, who's an economist. He said, bureaucracy is not an obstacle to democracy, but it's an inevitable complement to it. So my question for you is, as you watch this movie, do you agree or disagree with this statement? First and foremost, a bureaucracy is a large, complex administrative structure that handles the everyday business of an organization. To many Americans, the word bureaucracy suggests things as waste, red tape, and delay. While that image is not altogether unfounded, it is quite lopsided. Basically, bureaucracy is an efficient and effective way to organize people to do work. By definition, a bureaucracy is a system of organization built on three principles, hierarchical authority, job specialization, and formalized rules. The word hierarchical describes any organization structured as a pyramid with a chain of command running from the top of the pyramid to down to its base. Each bureaucrat or a person who works for the organization has certain defined duties and responsibility. Lastly, the bureaucracy does its work according to a number of established regulations and procedures. Those rules are set out in written form and so can be known by all who are involved in that work. Although there are millions of employees who work for the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy has a lot of power. Even though Congress comes up with the basic policies for a law, the actual day-to-day -day administration of the law is left to be worked out by the executive branch, especially the bureaucracy. This gives them a tremendous amount of power. The chief organizational feature of the federal bureaucracy is its division into areas of specialization. As you can see, the executive branch is composed of three broad groups of agencies, the executive office of the president, the 15 cabinet departments, and a large number of independent agencies. The titles given to the many units that make up the executive branch vary a great deal. The name department is reserved for agencies of cabinet rank. Beyond the title of department, however, there is little standardized use of titles among the agencies. The most commonly used titles for units in the executive branch include agency, administration, commission, corporation, authority, bureau, service, office, branch, and division. Every officer, employee, and agency in the executive branch of the federal government is legally subordinate to the president. They all exist to help him. But the president's right arm, however, is the executive office of the president. The executive office of the president is in fact an umbrella agency, a complex organization of several separate agencies staffed by some 1,800 of the president's key advisors and assistants. The EOP's nerve center is an agency now called the White House. Most of the president's key personal and political aides work there. The two wings on either side of the White House hold the offices of most of the president's staff. These presidential assistants occupy much of the crowded West Wing, which the public seldom sees and where the legendary Oval Office and the Cabinet Room are located. A number of assistants and deputy assistants to the president aid the chief executive in vital areas. For example, the White House Chief of Staff to the president directs all the operations of the EOP and is among the most influential presidential aides. The counselor to the president and a number of senior advisors are also key members of the president's inner circle. The staff of the White House office also includes such major presidential aides as the press secretary, the appointments and scheduling assistant, and the president's physician. Most of the president's major steps in foreign affairs are taken in close consultation with the National Security Council. Meets at the president's call often on short notice to advise him in all domestic, foreign, and military matters that relate to the nation's security. 
Another important office is the Office of Management and Budget, and it's the largest and after the White House the most influential unit in the executive office. The OMB is headed by a director who is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. The OMB's major task is the preparation of the federal budget, which the President must submit to Congress every year. Much of the work of the federal government is done by the 15 executive departments. Often called the cabinet departments, they employ nearly two-thirds of the federal government's civilian or non-military workforce. They are the traditional units of federal administration and each of them is built around some broad field of activity. Each department is headed by a secretary, except for the Department of Justice, whose work is directed by the Attorney General. As you will see, those department heads serve in the President's Cabinet. Their duties as the Chief Officers of the specific department take up most of their time. Each department head is the primary link between the presidential policy and his or her own department. Just as importantly, each of them also strives to promote and protect his or her department with the White House, with Congress, and its committees. Each department is also made up of a number of subunits. Each of these subunits or agencies is usually further divided into smaller working units. Let's use the Department of Justice for example. There are several subunits, including the Fraud Section and the Narcotic and Dangerous Drug Section. The Cabinet is the product of custom and usage. It's not mentioned in the Constitution. However, at its first session in 1789, Congress established four top-level executive posts. This included Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of War, and Attorney General. President George Washington was regularly seeking the advice of the four outstanding people he had named to those offices, including Jefferson, Hamilton, Henry Knox, and Edmund Randolph. By tradition, the heads of the now 15 executive departments form the cabinet. The president appoints the head of each of the 15 executive departments. Each of these appointments is subject to confirmation by the Senate, but rejections have been exceedingly rare. The President has several factors to consider when appointing cabinet members. This includes party affiliation and influence, professional qualifications and experience, regional background and ties to key issues handled by a given department, and a desire for gender, racial, and ethnic balance. Cabinet members have two major responsibilities. Individually, each is the administrative head of one of the executive departments, and collectively, they are advisors to the president. Today, the executive departments vary a great deal in terms of visibility, size, and importance. The Department of Defense is the largest, with nearly 700,000 civilian workers. The Department of State is the oldest and the most prestigious department, but is among the smallest, with only 30,000 employees. The Department of Health and Human Services has the largest budget. It accounts for just about a fourth of all federal spending, and the Department of Homeland Security became the newest of the executive departments when Congress created it in 2002. The importance of the cabinet has declined in recent years. This is due largely to the growth of the executive office of the president. However, no president has suggested getting rid of the cabinet, though they may rely more on unofficial advisors. Until the 1880s, nearly all the federal government did was done through its cabinet departments. But since then, Congress has created a large number of additional agencies, and these are called independent agencies, and they're located outside the departments. Today, they number more than 150. There are a few major reasons why independent agencies stand out. First of all, they've been set up outside the regular departmental structures simply because they do not fit well within any of the departments. Lastly, some agencies were created to protect them from influence of both partisan and pressure politics. It's important to note that the label independent agency is really a catch-all. There are three types of independent agencies, independent executive agencies, independent regulatory commissions, and government corporations. 
Most agencies we're going to see are independent executive agencies, and they include most of the non-cabinet agencies. Some are huge with thousands of employees, multi-million dollars, or even multi-billion dollar budgets, and they're extremely important public tasks to perform. The GSA, NASA, and the Environmental Protection Agency, also known as EPA, are some of the largest major executive agencies. Even though there's some well-known independent executive agencies, the majority have small staffs and budgets and receive very little public attention. The independent regulatory commissions stand out among the independent agencies because they are largely beyond the reach of presidential direction and control. These 12 commissions were created to monitor and police important aspect of the nation's economy. Most are headed by boards of five to seven members appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. But like I said, they're mostly out of reach of the president. Some well-known examples include the Federal Trade Commission, Consumer Product Safety Commission, and the Federal Reserve System. Lastly, we have a number of independent agencies that are known as government corporations. There are 50 corporations within the executive branch that are subject to the president's direction and control. They're set up by Congress to carry out certain business-like activity. These government corporations were rarely used until World War I and the Great Depression. Well-known examples of government corporations include the U.S. Postal Service, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, and the Tennessee Valley Authority. This concludes our video on the federal bureaucracy. I have a few questions for you to answer. Is the bureaucracy essential to good government? Is the number of agencies within the executive office of the president too large, too small, or just right? Do you think it's important the president selects the heads of the executive department? Why do you think congressmen create some independent agencies beyond the control of the president? And do you agree or disagree with Schumpter's quote, bureaucracy is not an obstacle to democracy, but an inevitable complement to it? I look forward to hearing your answers.